Okay, I'd, uh, I'd like to introduce now uh, Dr. Philip F. Young, who lectures at Maryland University College in African American Literature and Drama. And he is a private, also a private writing and educational consultant. Uh, he's published a book on African American drama and a novel called Monty, which I think has a certain Irish ring to it, uh, and some uh, various other articles on African uh, and African American literature. Uh, but I suppose, apart from those sound academic credentials, what's really interesting to my mind about Philip, I'm sure there's lots of interesting things about him, but for today's purposes, what's interesting about Philip is that Philip was actually um, a refugee. As a child, he was a refugee in Ireland um, from, from Biafra. Uh, and he's going to talk to us today about those refugees' ex experiences as a nine-year-old child. Am I right, Philip? Nine-year-old? As a nine-year-old child which I think has a real, I mean, it's very interesting in the context of, of our discussions today, but also has a resonance in terms of a, a situation that hasn't gone away, which is the situation of separated children in Ireland, because there's still a lot of children, uh, whether we call them separated children or unaccompanied minors, who come to Ireland on their own without their parents um, for refugee status. So Philip's story, although it happened quite some time ago, is still being played out today in other contexts. So with that, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Philip Effion. Thank you, and uh, good morning again. Can you hear me? Is this working? Okay. Um, I just want to start. Um, I wasn't going to do this, but I have uh, what I, I'll describe as a preamble, um, just so people can get excited. I realize I'm going to be talking for a while, and I don't want you to uh, get bored. So um, part of what we've been talking about is how uh, the story of Biafra and, and, and Biafra's relationship to Ireland should be kept alive, and I want you to know that in some ways I'm trying to keep the story alive. And I'll share a couple of things. This will take about two minutes. Uh, first of all, my, my father's book. Um, unfortunately, he passed away before the book was released, but he had given me the, the material, and I was able to put it together. And um, right now, you know, it can be... Um, gotten from uh, Amazon.com. I'm trying to get a new publisher for the book who I think will be more ex uh, effective as far as distribution and, and marketing. So that's one, that's one Biafran artifact. It's not yet an artifact. Um, Biafran icon, if you like, um, right there, the book. And then a couple of other things. <clears throat> This is a, you call it a muffler, right? I think in the U.S. this is called a scarf, a Biafran scarf right there. Um, and someone should help me if anybody has information on how I can really preserve these things because I'm getting worried that uh, termites might eat through them or something. But I think this speaks to the ingenuity of the people. This is well over 40 years old. And look at how good it still is. Um, unfortunately, I can't give this away. Um, but I thought I should share. Um, sp I'm partly inspired because of the, the flag I see there. And then um, <clears throat> this is one of my favorites, the Biafran tie. And you look at how this has stayed. Again, it speaks to the ingenuity of the people. I don't know when they had the time to make things like this, right? Okay. frankly speaking. Um, I actually lent this to a friend who kept it for about 20 years and gave it back to me this year. And uh, actually, he didn't give it back. I demanded it. And, uh, but look at how beautiful it is. I wear it sometimes. It is thin. It's not as, as thick as a lot of ties but it's, that you have today, but it's just as beautiful. And so I thought I'd share this. Um, if I had a shirt, I would probably have worn it. But if I wear it, you probably think I'm a little crazy if I wore it over this. <laughs> but most important of all is something I rescued from a family compound in 2005. And if you know anything about African compounds, you know that property there can be considered communal. And if people don't value them, they go pick them. And the moment I saw this, I took it with me. This is my father's hat. This is the hat he wore as a, as a general. Again, um, after the session, if someone can advise me on how to preserve these things, I would really be grateful because if you notice from the way I'm carrying them around, I don't exactly, um, I'm not exactly doing a good job. But anyway, um, now to my presentation. 
I describe, I title it Sleepwalk Through Ireland, and hopefully when we get to the end of it, you'll understand why I describe it as Sleepwalk Through Ireland, a post-war memoir. Now, a lot has already been said about um, the, the um, refugee situation and what caused it in, and what led to uh, the crisis, and um, try not to read this. This is just for my benefit. I also have the slide because I have some images I want to share. But um, um, the, the, some of the causes of the refugee problem, some people talk about the war, but it actually started before the war. It started with the massacre, with the um, destruction of property of Easterners in the north. And so you had thousands of Easterners fleeing from, um, from the north. This was after the first coup. There were incidents in May, I believe in July, August and September, perhaps September arguably being one of the worst situations where there were just massacres of children, women, men, people lost property, lost their businesses, their means of livelihood, and um, eventually they would, you had massive numbers of people just coming to the east, which proved to be a major burden for the government as well as for relatives and extended family members who had to take care of them. So that was, that was where the problem really started. But of course, it, it was aggravated by the war. And the, the, the moment the enemy started to capture cities and communities, you had bigger displacements of um, civilian populations, mainly. And people started to um, relocate. And in the process of relocating, they abandoned property, they abandoned their means of livelihood. And um, those who were originally taking care of people who had come from the north now found, found themselves destitute as well. But apart from the incursion of the enemy into Biafra, into communities, there were other problems uh, which were largely um, championed by uh, Chief Awolowo, who was um, the federal minister of finance, as well as, I, I believe, the, uh, the, the, the deputy chairman of the Supreme Military Council. And he advanced policies like the use of um, starvation as a legitimate instrument of war. And following that, you had the economic blockade of Biafra, which has already been spoken about, the devaluation of the Biafran currency. Now, the economic blockade of Biafra was perhaps most gruesomely realized in, in, on the 5th of June, 1969, when a Red Cross plane carrying Norwegians, I believe a couple of Swedish passengers, and Americans was shut down. But the result of all of this, <coughs> serious refugee problems at the beginning of the war, and um, so camps, refugee camps were hurriedly established. Many of them were carved out of former schools um, or government buildings. Some of them were just makeshift buildings. But um, I, I think it would be good at this point to acknowledge the help of those countries that either recognized or were sympathetic to Biafra uh, at least its peoples were. You know, like Ireland, people say Ireland didn't give formal recognition. I, I really don't care as long as the vast majority of the people or a significant number of the people were concerned. As far as I'm concerned, uh, Biafra supported, uh, I mean, uh, Ireland supported Biafra. So, you know, I, I, I want to acknowledge the Ivory Coast, South Tome, Ireland, of course, Gabon, Tanzania, uh, Zambia, and other countries which helped through supply of uh, medical uh, uh, needs, clothing, food, helped to establish these refu refugee camps. And this list is not exhaustive, but these are the list, but these are some of the groups, the humanitarian organizations that I continue to hear that were um, active in running and helping to sustain these um, refugee camps. And I've listed them, Caritas has already been mentioned, the Red Cross, the World Council of Churches, Holy Ghost Fathers of Ireland, the World I, I repeat the World Council of Churches, but anyway. Joint Church Aid, Catholic Relief Services, Salvation Army, you know, and, and I, I said the list is not um, exhaustive. For instance, I only learned, and I probably should be embarrassed about uh, Africa concern in detail during this um, conference, and I definitely want to acknowledge uh, Africa concern and other groups that I don't, uh, that I haven't mentioned. I, I want to personally say that we are grateful to, to these uh, countries and uh, organizations, and each time I have the opportunity, I will express that gratitude. 
Let me digress a little bit and say something about the refugee camps, because there's the general notion that they, uh, they were filled with very sick, dying, malnourished children, women, men, and um, there was just filth and general decay. To an extent, that is true. For instance, at um, a place called Ifakala in um, Mbitoli local government area, I think that's where it is in modern Nigeria, um, I witnessed some of the most horrible refugee camp situations. Now, we lived in Ifakala because we were homeless at the time, believe it or not. I know it's hard to believe that General F. Young's family could have been homeless during the war, but Umwa had, had just fallen, and my dad's um, first ADC, his family, in this place called Ifakala, took us in, and we were there for several weeks. And there were refugee camps around there, and it was just, it was my first observation of the real horrors of the war. Um, I saw those kids, some of them were my friends, uh, I played with them, but I also witnessed a lot of death, a lot of starvation. The images we saw in the um, documentary yesterday of the children with thin legs, you know, the big heads, the big stomachs, I saw them, and that was a really, really touching and moving uh, observation, even though I was a child, the images are just so clear. And, and those images are partly what informed the novel um, that, that I would eventually write called um, Monty. But aside from that image, there was another image that I think we should recognize. And um, when Oweri was recaptured by Biafra and we moved to Oweri, we visited another refugee camp in uh, my state, present Akwaibom state, uh, in a place called Ntordino. And it was run by uh, one Reverend Father Umana, who, was, um, who later became the principal of the secondary school I went to. But that refugee camp, it was amazing. It was just vibrant. It was full of life. It was full of healthy people, children, the men, the women. There was electricity most of the time because the generator you know, was functioning well. The children formed mock militia uh, groups. They marched around. There was just life. There was food. There was health. So I think it is important to, 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 to mention this to understand that it wasn't a wasted effort. The, the, the refugee camp situation and the efforts to establish them wasn't a wasted effort. And before we left this refugee camp at Ntordino, the refugees actually put on a play. It was a major play that lasted probably about an hour, 30 minutes. And looking back, I just wonder when did they even put the script together? It was amazing. And um, they also had a traditional performance um, right after the play. So it's the reason why I'm mentioning this is it will help me move into the, uh, the other aspect of, of the refugee situation, which I'm going to talk about and which concerns me directly, and that's the intervention by some countries uh, that would not only supply to these refugee camps, but would also take some of the refugees and, and provide a sanctuary for them in their countries. That also helped um, uh, with the refugee situation, it helped to um, eventually save lives and, and provide people, especially children, with much needed food, much needed health care, education, and clothing. So um, the, refugee, uh, uh, the refugee situation on many levels was successful, and it was, this was another level by which it was successful when these countries, um, I mentioned Gabon and Ivory Coast, I think Gabon and Ivory Coast took in perhaps the most because of the proximity to Nigeria. It was just easy to, relatively easy, to um, fly them um, to, to Gabon and Ivory Coast. So you had large numbers. Of course, um, Ireland would take in a significant number of refugees. It mightn't have been as easy because of, 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 of the question of proximity. But uh, a lot of uh, refugees were also taken in by Ireland. Um, especially during the latter part and uh, even at the end of the war, um, towards the end of the war and after the war. And I'd mentioned yesterday that, if you look at my second bullet there, that you do have today post-war Biafran communities. That's how I describe them in Gabon and the Ivory Coast. You have communities that um, have people that are in major ways descendants 
of uh, the refugees that eventually stayed back because not all of them eventually returned to Nigeria. Some eventually stayed there and, and would uh, begin new lives and create new families. <clears throat> Now, um, how do I fit into this picture? Like uh, you were probably aware I was a refugee for a while, about seven months here in Ireland, but there was really no original plan for me and my uh, immediate older brother to be refugees. There were plans for my oldest uh, sisters, Rosalind, Mercy, and my older brother, Valentine. I think... Um, the decision was made initially to have to send them to Ireland because I think their education was considered more urgent than the education of we younger ones. Um, I think that was the plan. That's how I see it. So my sisters already moved to Ireland probably a year before the uh, war ended and my brother a uh, few months after. And uh, they stayed with a number of families. Uh, uh, John and Kay, have to, I thought it was only one family, but they, they stayed. I knew that they stayed with the Murphys, and it's amazing because Moira Murphy, now Moira O'Brien is right here uh, with her husband, Barry. I've not seen Moira in 40 years, since 1970. And, and, you know, she's come out here. So the continuity is there. You see, it's still playing out. But anyway, um, with my brother and myself, as well as my younger brother and a cousin. It was all a question of chance. It was just a question of circumstances that uh, eventually made us refugees. What happened was this. With the second collapse of Owere, it was, I think it was clear at that point that the Africa couldn't sustain itself. It was on the verge of collapse. And uh, let me just go through very briefly what happened that night, my dad wasn't at home in Oweri, and the sounds of the mortars, the shells, the gunfire was so close, and we panicked. And my mom just threw a couple of things into her driver's car, and, and we left. We had no destination. Now, her driver, that was an interesting uh, arrangement between my mom and driver, because he came with his own car. You know, most, in most African countries where you have a driver, they drive your car, but this was a driver who used his own car. <laughs> you know, and it, I remember it was a Peugeot 404 station wagon. But when we left, um, the roads were crowded. Unfortunately, the car wasn't moving faster than people on foot. The only real advantage is that we were sitting down, but we were really not moving any faster. And um, if you know anything about uh, Biafran fuel, that there was this constant ex ex explosive sound from the exhaust pipe, and you know, people kept docking. <laughs> I think they were upset with us. Um, but eventually the car just gave up and stopped, and we just stayed at the roadside, and um, about an hour later, my, dra my dad drove by with his small convoy. It had, it, has, it had reduced in size significantly at this point. He drove by. I don't know if he was looking for us or if he just met us by chance. But anyway, he stopped, took us, and put us somewhere for the night. I, I don't remember. It was really just some hurried arrangement. We, we slept somewhere. And then the next day, we headed straight for Newi which uh, is General Ojuku's uh, hometown. And I didn't know what had happened. It was later that my parents would tell me the story. And that's how we came to become refugees. And this is what happened. Ojuku had already made plans to leave and had informed my dad that he would be handing over to him. My mom was pregnant at the time. So my dad, he definitely was not happy about the situation, but he said, well, I'll stay. However, take my wife, she's pregnant. I'm concerned about her health. And that's how, and the, and the general, the head of state agreed, and that's how my mom would eventually leave, and that's how we would leave with them. Uh, my mom would leave with me, my immediate older brother, Charles, my younger brother, Francis, and a cousin who was with us, my dad's older brother's uh, daughter. And so things happened very fast. By the 7th of January, we were in uh, Oweri, and this was the 8th, uh, we were leaving uh, Biafra. And that same day, in the evening, you know, we were taken to Uli Airport. There was a lot of security. It was dark, minimal light was being used. 
and we left on a, a cargo plane that didn't have seats. And what happened was um, you just placed, a ladder was placed against the, um, the, the, the um, plane, and you, you climbed in, and then your luggage was thrown in. You put your luggage on the floor, and you sat on it. There were a couple of other Biafran families there, including, I remember very well, Ojuku's mother. And she had a problem climbing into the plane. So what happened was to reduce the, ga the gap between the rungs, I remember someone would go when she would climb, someone would go and put his head, and she would put her foot on his head and go to the next rung, and that's how she eventually uh, got into the plane. Um, I remember Ojuku's secretary, uh, Enyu Akpan, his wife and children were also in that plane. So things happened so fast, but it was not planned. And um, our next arrival was uh, Sao Tome, where um, families were distributed, you know, uh, different arrangements were, were made to take care of different uh, families. And we um, stayed with a family called the Money Case. And um, we stayed there for about two weeks. And then we left. And uh, like I said, this wasn't planned because eventually our final destination was the Ivory Coast. But we went first of all to Portugal, Lisbon, before coming down to the Ivory Coast. And we left um, to Portugal with uh, the, the, uh, the secretary of uh, Ojuku's secretary's wife and children. And we stayed in a hotel, which I remember, Hotel Infante Santo. That was the name, and it's always stayed in my head. We stayed there for about two weeks. And then uh, we left, just me, my mom, uh, my older brother, my younger brother, and our cousin. We left, and our next uh, uh, stop was, um, was Abidjan. Let me state that uh, the flight from Sao Tome to Lisbon was uh, also on a, a plane that didn't have seats, uh, except that it was a, a larger plane. It was slightly more com comfortable, but it was several hours. Um, I, I think I got used to it, and I always laugh when I enter a plane today, and they say, uh, fasten your seat belts. I'm like, you just don't understand. <laughs> so <laughs> so we, uh, from Ab Abidjan, we spent about, um, about um, a week in a hotel in Abidjan, and then later on we were chauffeured to Boaké, which is one of the um, larger cities in the central uh, part of the Ivory Coast. Boaké, I actually enjoyed. We settled down nicely. Uh, there were several Biafran families and children, including Ojuku's extended family with so many children, and we just had enough people to play with. We also made friends with, with some of the local children, and uh, uh, Charles and myself, you know, we had, we had fun in the neighborhood, you know, playing soccer and, you know, just going from compound to compound, settling in nicely. We picked, actually picked up a little French, and then um, we also began to attend school at one of the facilities. I don't know if I should call it a camp. It looked more like a boarding school. And when I remember, look back at the images from the documentary yesterday, I, I can't just imagine that some of those children were in the situation that we saw. They were so alive, so energetic. Uh, they were very happy. You know, and we made friends with a lot of them. We enjoyed um, going to school. There's a lot of the, some of the teachers were from the former Biafran area, some women. And then there was a reverend father. Someone mentioned something about, I, I forgot his name, but someone mentioned the name of the reverend father at one of the camps in the Ivory Coast. I think that was him, an Irish reverend father. It was very funny. Um, and, and some days he would come to class wearing a glass, uh, wearing his glasses without a, a glass and one of the, uh, I don't know if that was just done for, for, for uh, humorous effects or if he couldn't really afford better glasses. <laughs> but anyway, it, it, it was all nice in Boaké and just when it seemed as if we were going to stay there for a long time, my mom would have her baby. Remember the baby that was the original reason why we left? And um, she maintained communication uh, thanks to, um, again, supporters of Biafra. Somehow they took letters back and forth to my dad in spite of the, the difficult situation my dad was going through. And my dad immediately sent word that she should be called Philippa. Um, I'm Philip. He must really like his name. So um, she was born on, on the 24th. She was born on the 24th of uh, April. 
And um, around that time, um, soon after, my mom begins to inform Charles and I that we're going to go to Ireland and join uh, my older sisters and my brother. And she kept giving us instructions almost every day. And I wondered why until I realized it was because we were going to travel alone. We're not going to travel with any um, adult. And uh, I'll give you some more details about that. But here's a picture of uh, that is Charles right there. That's my younger brother, Francis. Charles is um, a lawyer in Calabar, uh, Nigeria. Francis teaches. He's in Port Harcourt. Port Harcourt and, and that's me. And, well, you know what I'm doing and where I am right now. So that, that's us in Boake. Um, I'm so glad this picture survived. Um, so anyway, the arrangements are made, and we, we would eventually leave Charles and I with just instructions. And, and I can't imagine, because I have daughters now that are six, and one will soon be 10, one is 12. And I just look at them, and I imagine putting them on a plane. Uh, but anyway, we, we, we left with our instructions. I think we followed them well. At one point, we were received by a lady that, to me, I think she, I remember her to be some kind of an air hostess or something of the sort. But anyway, she gave us further guidance. The only hitch was that at some point, we, um, our flight was delayed, and I panicked and started to cry. And my brother just looked at me. He was about the same size, about, you know, not much older, so. But anyway, that, that, that slight um, um, uh, uh, problem, you know, passed by, and, um, you know, we got on our flight and, and, and eventually arrived at, uh, at Dublin. I'm not sure, is it the same airport? I, I, I wouldn't know. Okay, if it's the same, then that's amazing. Uh, I couldn't remember anything, though, from the airport, and we were received by my brothers and sisters and the Murphys. And... Um, we were taken to another family in another section of, uh, of Ireland, of Dublin, and um, that bothered me for a number of reasons. The family was great. The family did everything to take care of us, but I state at the last bullet that I am con contented but also sad and lonely because it's the first time that I'm living with people who are not my parents, and at least one parent is not around. It had never happened before. Now, if I had lived with my older sisters, they were closer to being parent figures to me because they're significantly older than me. That may have worked, but Charles was about my height, about my size, so he didn't provide too much uh, consolation in terms of security. <laughs> So I, I, many times I, 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 I was sad. I missed my, my parents, but I, I don't want you to go away feeling that that was my story. There were a number of things that I consider um, welcome distractions. There, of course, there were more than distractions. Um, one was school. Um, we started to go to school, and it's terrible that I don't remember the name of that school. And I tried to get Charles before I came here to remind me he never responded. He probably doesn't remember. But anyway, school was about an hour, about a mile and a half, two miles away. Sometimes we walked there, played on the streets um, with other kids before we got there. Sometimes we got a ride there. But school was great because there was a, a, a diversity of people from different countries. Um, I was put in, well, in the U.S. it would be called grade four. What is the... Is it Form 4, Class 4? Four? Okay, that's why I was, I don't know how that was determined, because throughout the world I didn't go to school after kindergarten. And I was, put, occasionally we had teachers who would, who would, my mom would arrange to teach us, but anyway, I, put, I was put there, and I think I got along academically quite well and moved on, and my brother was put in the uh, sixth class. And um, so that, it was great because it was a time to play. We enjoyed walking, just the walk to school. We got to meet new friends. And also related to my education is the fact that the O'Connells also really encouraged me to read. And one of the books I read a lot were the naughty books. Do they still exist? Yes, they do. Okay. Nobody seems to know about them in the U.S., but, you know. I think that really helped develop my whatever reading skills I have. Um, so the naughty books, I spent hours reading them. I enjoyed them. And then church was the biggest ironic um, 
welcome distraction for me because I hated church up, up until that point. It was very boring. Um, and throughout the war, you know, in terms of church facilities, what did we have? Nothing as grand as the buildings here. You know, the grandeur, the, the architecture, the color, everything was so, uh, 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 was, 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 you know, uh, really excited me. And interestingly enough, the messages, because I remember the priest saying, taste and see that the Lord is good. And, you know, I would go back and think, the Lord is good, so my situation, he'll take care of it, you know. And I wanted to believe that everybody around me was good and kind. So church, you know, I can't believe how important church came to me because prior to that time, I think I, I was just a bad kid who didn't care about such things. And, and there was an aspect of church that I also loved, and that was the confessions. Because in Nigeria, you know, you'd go to confess and the priest would be there. And I was always nervous talking to this man about my e the evil things I had done. And he was right there. But, but the church is here. It was like there was this closed space. And the priest was in this middle place. It, I could hardly see his face. So it was as if my evil, the evil things I did were gu guarded. I didn't feel that threatened. I didn't feel that I was being that public. You know, and he would open this little window and put his ears and... <laughs> yeah, I had no problem just telling him, you know. <laughs> you know, so... Um, so that was great. And, um, and, and you know, but, but the, it, it, the challenges were there. And, and some of the things that I took for granted became problems. Again, no fault of the O'Connells, just circumstances. Um, one was what to do with our hair. Because my hair continued to grow and grow. And, you know, usually my mom would step in and get a, a, a barber to cut it. Um, uh, but Mrs. O'Connell, God bless her heart, would sit me down and pick my knots one at a time. And I would just sit there in tears, you know, because it hurt. And, and she didn't know what to really do with my hair. And one day decided to take me to a barber, take my, myself and my brother. And, and the barber she could easily have just said, I don't know how to cut this type of hair. But he went ahead and did a terrible job. <laughs> and, and when my sister, when my sister Rosalind saw, she almost went. She almost had a fit. But you know, we, we went past that stage. And, and another problem was, you know, I, I hate to admit it in front of, of strangers, but I went to bed, um, which was no big deal in my family. My mom knew. Everybody knew. But. In the O'Connell home, it was a source of great embarrassment. So, but anyway, um, the, the, the distractions helped. And one of the, the, the greatest, for me, the most exciting distraction was when we went to the Murphy home. Why? Because I described that there was a certain sense of, there was a certain Nigerian flavor. Now, Mr. Murphy had lived uh, for a long time in Nigeria, and he was responsible in some ways for the building of the cathedral in, uh, the Catholic cathedral in Oweri. And um, he always had stories to tell about Nigeria. So he kind of brought me close to home. And he also spoke Pidgin English, which is a, a creolized form of English spoken in, in Cameroon, in Ghana, in Nigeria, with, with variations in Liberia and Sierra Leone. So anytime he spoke it, I was so thrilled, and I engaged him in conversation. And then there was also a sense of enhanced security because my older siblings were there. And, and for me, unlike Charles, they, 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 like I said, they provided more a parent uh, a figure. They were more like parent figures to me. And each time we left the uh, Murphy home, I always cried. I always cried when we were taking back. But again, it was really all about me and not about um, the O'Connells. Um, so, but you know, I don't want to Oh, before I go to say, I just want to share some pictures, courtesy of uh, Moira. Um, you can see right there, that's my oldest sister, Rosalind. That's Charles. That's Valentine. He's an artist in, in Holland. I think I should give you all his website. You, you will like his art. That's me, of course, and that's Mercy. During one of our visits to the, to the Morphys, we decided to take group photographs, which has proven to be just the best thing, because these are priceless pictures. And here's another one, this time, again with us here, Rosalind, oops, what did I do? Yeah, uh, Rosalind, Charles, Valentine, myself, Mercy, and that's Mr. Murphy, and there's Moira right there. Oh. <laughs> and that's her mother, and that's Jerry, her brother. Sorry, I keep doing that. 
So you see these are priceless pictures which she has allowed me to use here. And uh, look at how beautiful uh, these pictures still are after about 40 years. Um, but I, I, I was saying that I just don't want this to be as if it was a question of survival for me. It was, I don't want you to go away with the impression that, oh, it was sad and I had to look for ways to be happy. No. I eventually immersed myself into, uh, I, uh, into the life, uh, Irish life, into a number of things, and I enjoyed it, my stay here, and I have nothing but fond memories. The food, I've not yet had uh, mashed potatoes and sausages, what you call, um, is it bang, ba bang as a mash? I, I hope I do before we leave, but it was, I just love to eat them. The fish and chips, now in the U.S. occasionally you will have, I, I would eat fries and fish. It's never been the same. I still <laughs> crave um, fish and chips. Um, and then the chocolates and pastry, you can't even imagine going through a war where you never saw these things. I mean, prior to the war, occasionally I might have had ice cream or a sweet. But here was all this chocolate, all this cake, the pastries. I just indulged myself and had a great time, you know, eating these foods. Apple cider, it was here in Ireland that I first had apple cider, homemade apple cider, uh, when we were in the Aran Islands. Now, Guinness Stout. I didn't drink it then because I was too young, of course. But later on, you know, when I would drink Guinness Stout uh, as, a, as a grown up, as a young man, it would have a lot to do with my memories of, of the euphoria that, seemed, that the Irish people seemed to have when they drank this <laughs> black liquid. Um, I, also, I also played uh, rugby. I learned how to play rugby here in Ireland. I learned how to play cricket. Um, I played a little bit of Gaelic, but my brother, Charles, played more Gaelic and even played for the school. So I want you to understand that we enjoyed Ireland and we immersed ourselves into the life and culture. And one of the most fascinating experiences was uh, when we went to uh, Galway. Um, um, we passed through Galway. We were really going through to the Iron Islands. I don't know how that worked, but the Iron, Iron Islands I have beautiful memories of. You know, it reminded me of rural life in Nigeria. I remember some of the buildings had thatched roofs. I remember visiting some of the caves where monks were supposed to have lived. I remember the rocky roads, the rocky walls. And of course, for the first time also, and the only time in my life, I participated in Halloween in October. And um, you'll probably be happy to know that I went around as a gorilla. It, <laughs> it, it, worked, it worked very well. I got, got a lot of candy, a lot of fruit. Um, that's my brother and I in, in, um, in the Aran Islands. That's, um, Charles right there, that's me, and you guessed right if you guessed that we're eating chocolate. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> anyway, I'll hurry up and, and, and round up. Around November of that same year, the, the, you know, the, the, the O'Connells begin to tell us that, uh, begin to indicate that we, we would be returning to Nigeria. And um, just as things happened so fast when we were coming, they happened so fast when we were leaving, the, you know, re arrangements were all made by uh, December. Um, I, I believe we had um, said bye to uh, my older sisters and brother and, and the Murphys. And on this day, we were taken to the uh, airport. And my brother and I, um, at first we thought we were traveling alone again, but when we got there, there were about 19 other Biafran children that were being sent back. And um, there were probably about three adults with us, three women. And it, things happened so fast, and by the next day we were in Ikeja Airport in, um, in Nigeria. And photographs were taken of the group, and then photographs were taken of just Charles and myself. And I remember in that photograph, I was there holding the, the football that, um, that, I, um, that, that, that I traveled with, that had been given to me as a gift. Now, football had, was, you know, I, I didn't mention this, but was another great distraction. Even though I played football a little bit, during the war, those pastimes really didn't exist. But, but here in Ireland, you know, we played in the road in front of the house. Sometimes we went to a big field in one of the schools and played. For the first time, I, you know, I witnessed the, um, the rivalries and the leagues on TV. I'd never watched matches on TV, so football was a great thing. I came back with this football, 
and um, we were put in a facility. I don't know where that building, what it was, but we were all put in this building and we stayed in Lagos for about three days. The only thing I really remember about that building was that we were totally eaten up by mosquitoes. I remember very well. Fortunately, none of us came down with uh, malaria. And then we used to go and eat during the day. We were all marched. About <coughs> 21 of us were all marched to another facility to eat. And that facility had, interestingly enough, Biafran children. I think they were probably some of the returnees from the Ivory Coast and Gabon. But we used to go there and eat. And um, around the third day or so, uh, arrangements were made for some of us to be uh, taken to uh, the east. Now, the picture that we're taking at the airport, I don't know if the, published, if the papers published the group picture, but they published the one with just Charles and I. So my parents, at that point, my mom had already returned from Ivory Coast, and she, had, uh, she was now with my dad. Uh, she and, and my younger brother and cousin were now with my dad. And they saw this picture in the papers, but had no clue where we were or how to contact us. So I don't know how they handled that. But anyway, we were finally all, uh, some of us, not all of us, were put in a, 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 a Volkswagen bus, what we call a Danfo bus. And uh, it was about an eight hour ride or nine hour ride to the east, and once we got into the east, we knew because the, the evidence of war was still everywhere. You know, you still had buildings filled with holes from explosives and bullets. The roads still had craters. Our final destination was Enugu, which was the capital of the east central state and former capital, first capital of Biafra. Um, something very disturbing happened at this point because families, the kids were gradually taken and dropped off with families or extended families or friends until just Charles and myself were left in the, in the bus. And I, you know, I started to panic again, like, are they taking us to our parents? What's going to happen to us? Somehow uh, the driver, and I don't know how he knew, um, took us to uh, my aunt's place. My aunt lived in a, a part of Enugu called Coal Camp. I don't know how he was given the directions, but that's where he took us. <laughs> And next to my parents, my aunt was the next best thing. This was my mom's immediate older sister. And um, we, we, when we got there, she wasn't at home. So that was another source of panic for me. So I, of course, started to cry. And um, Charles just sat down there as usual and just looked at me. He was strong. He didn't cry. Um, then my aunt arrived and consoled me. And everything calmed down. And we were there for about um, two weeks. Um, and one day, at this point, let me just state that life was very unstable for my parents who were trying to start life all over again, find a means of livelihood, and they constantly were, they were constantly wandering from Enugu to Ikorekpene uh, and, and, um, and um, Oweri. And on this day, they were just coming to see my aunt. And who did they see there? Sir so Charles and myself. I, you know, I can't explain the, ex the joy and um, the excitement, but at that point I was relieved, basically relieved that um, a journey that had begun about a year earlier at Uli Airport in Biafra had finally come to an end in Coal Camp uh, in Ugu. Um, let me add that um, quickly, that, you know, the, the, the uh, travels and, 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 and stay in Ireland, you know, provided, um, helped me to grow up in certain ways, in ways that I was really not prepared for. Of course, the war had done that, you know. From when we were, uh, when we squatted with a family in um, Lagos after the first, after the second coup to my experiences of the war, the refugee camp situations, the bombings, everything, I think I got a little tougher, a little hardened. Um, otherwise, prior to that time, my life had largely been quite sheltered. Um, so I was taken out of my comfort zone, um, essentially. Um, and what Ireland did for me, like I, I, it just added to this. It provided me with a new form of growth, uh, one that helped move me into a tougher, I guess, more self-reliant and, and creative person. Um, uh, let me add also that there has been continuity, which I started off with. Um, fortunately, uh, I, I reconnected with, with Moira through Facebook. Facebook can be that useful. And um, 
communication continued between my parents and the Murphys, as well as my parents and the O'Connells. And um, let me just, this is one of the things Moira shared with me. It's a letter that my mom wrote. It's dated 29 December 1969. She found it. I don't know where she found it. And she sent it to me. I'm not going to read this letter, but it's a letter written to my older um, sisters and brother when they were in Ireland. I think it's just amazing. Um, and she had good, beautiful handwriting too, unlike me. This is where, and, and at some point, the Murphys visited us in uh, Enugu in Nigeria. And um, that's Mrs. Murphy there. That's my older sister, Rosalind. That's Valentine. That's Charles. That's Francis, my younger brother. That's Philippa, who was born in the Ivory Coast, sorry. Um, of course, you know who that is, mm -hmm. right there. That's Mercy. And look at my mom looking like the rest of us. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> so um, these are pictures from uh, Moira. Let me end this part I really want to read because I want to make sure this message is, uh, is clear. I would like to thank the Catholic Church and the Irish Catholic personnel who risked all to live with us in Biafra, suffer with us in Biafra, and face threats um, in Biafra, all with the purpose of feeding hungry Biafrans, clothing naked Biafrans, healing sick Biafrans, and reiterating uh, divine sustenance in a dismal situation that proved too difficult for human effort. Without the church, Biafra would have probably capitu capitulated or collapsed at least a year before it did. Um, to Ireland, I cannot give enough gratitude. Its support for Biafra was principled, and when I say Ireland, I mean the people of Ireland. And it was based on a humane concern for justice and the right to self-determination. There are no reports, no evidence, and nothing in Ireland's history that I know of that cites it as a greedy or rogue nation that would put material and financial profit or territorial expansion above the sacredness of human life. It did not exacerbate the Nigeria-Biafra con conflict like some other nations did through the supply of ammunition but concentrated on the preservation of human life through the provision of essential aid and the demonstration of the Christian principle of charity. By recognizing Biafra and providing refuge for its citizens, recognition coming from the people, Ireland played an immense role in protecting and saving lives and in prolonging Biafra's existence. I remain eternally grateful to the O'Connells and Murphys who took care of me, my brothers, and my sisters during our stay in Ireland. It was a time of great uncertainty for us, but both families worked hard, tirelessly and selflessly to reassure us that we had nothing to worry about. They nurtured us and filled us with, with renewed hope and confidence. And for listening to me, I'd like to say thank you. Yeah,